Hello, everybody. This is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, tonight, I'm continuing in the uh, study of the book of Proverbs, and I'll begin in chapter 26, verse 1. If you haven't seen the previous episodes of this study yet, they are uploaded on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. So feel free to go back and watch this from the beginning. Uh, I'm going to go through it in the KJV first, uh, and then I'll compare it to the Amplified. Sometimes the Amplified uh, amplifies the verse, and I find it to be helpful. So let's begin. It says, As snow in summer, and as rain in harvest, so honor is not seemly for a fool. Honor is not seemly for a fool. Well, in the Amplified, it phrases it, like snow in summer and like rain in harvest, so honor is not fitting for a short-sighted fool. Well, I guess, I guess it'd be helpful to explain just a little bit about the book of Proverbs. Uh, if you haven't been watching this from the beginning, the book of Proverbs is uh, a unique book in the Bible. Um, see, the Bible is a history book. It's a, it tells the history of peoples and, uh, uh, and, and events. And it's, it's a true story. But the book of Proverbs is, is unlike, the, say, the Genesis and Exodus and, and the book of John and the book of Job. These are stories about things that happened and people that actually lived. But the book of Proverbs is written by King Solomon, who was the son of King David. And King Solomon said that the reason he was writing this was so that his son could learn wisdom. And since it's written down and it's preserved through all these uh, centuries, we also can learn wisdom by reading what Solomon wrote. But unlike a uh, continuous, cohesive story you find in the the other books of the Bible. The book of Proverbs is a, a series of sayings or, quote, proverbs. Sometimes the proverb is one singular verse that stands alone and teaches a lesson intended for us to gain some wisdom. Uh, sometimes the proverb may be uh, two, three, four verses connected together to to, to complete the thought, and that would be another proverb. So in, in this verse here, this, there's a recurring theme in the book of Proverbs contrasting a wise man with a fool. Uh, so we want to be wise rather than foolish. If we're wise, we're going to get good results out of our decisions in life. If we're foolish, the decisions we make are going to just end up being disastrous for us. So uh, there's a lot of themes that are repeated over and over again throughout 31 books of Proverbs. But uh, this idea of being a fool is threaded throughout the whole thing. So let me read it again now that you understand how the book was written. It says, as snow in summer and as rain in harvest, so honor is not seemly for a fool. Uh, so... Uh, we don't honor fools. Foolish things that people do when they act foolishly, we should not, you know, uh, honor it in any way. We should point out that that's foolish and, and uh, not give it any kind of honor or respect. Verse 2, as the bird by wandering, as the swallow by flying, so the curse cause, causeless shall not come. So the curse causeless shall not come so see this verse here uh, there, there's almost all of this bible um when i read it it's pretty clear what it's saying even though i read it in the kjv and it's an ancient form of english it's it's not our native form of english that we have today uh and i do find that Old English, the KJV, Shakespearean style English, 
I do find it more difficult than reading contemporary modern English, but for the most part, even in the KJV, when I read it, I'm going to understand it. But there might be 1% or 5% of the verses we find throughout the Bible. It's just uh, not that clear because of the way the sentence is structured and the uh, some of the words are used are archaic. They're not used any longer. Um, so in those cases, I find it really helpful to look at a, a modern translation. And the one that I like is the Amplified, not because it's so accurate, but just because it amplifies what the verse is saying. Let me see who's just joining me here. Neil. All okay, Neil, you are visible. Hi. Hey, what's up, man? Oh, just continuing through Proverbs. How are you doing tonight? Good. I love Proverbs. Yes. Well, that's the first thing uh, in wisdom is, is to love the pursuit of wisdom. I wish I got wisdom when I was your age. <laughs> you know, her, my, my father-in-law called me the same thing. <laughs> yes. Uh, kind of wisdom is wasted on the old. I don't know. I, I just kind of made that up. Maybe someone else has already said it. I think someone said, like, youth is wasted on the young or something. But I think wisdom is wasted. On, as we get older, we get wiser. But we've already made so many mistakes that we, we should, should learn wisdom. That's why Solomon, when he wrote Proverbs, he's writing it for his son. He wants his son to learn to be wise at a young age so he doesn't have to make foolish mistakes throughout his life. Uh, okay, well, I'm... Uh, I, on chapter 26, and I just read uh, verse 2, and I was making the point. I read it in the KJV, and then I was explaining why oftentimes I'll look at the amplified version is that probably 95 or 99 percent of all the verses in the Bible, even in the KJV, I could understand it, but there are some verses that because of the way that the sentence is structured or and some of the old words that are used, I need to go look at some modern translation to get some help. And I like the amplified, not because I think it's so perfect, but it, just because it amplifies, it expounds. It's almost like reading the scriptures with a commentary built into it. So sometimes it's helpful. And that's where I am now on verse 2 in chapter 26. It says in the KJV, as the bird wandering, uh, I'm sorry, as the bird by wandering, and, and as uh, as the swallow by flying, so the curse, causeless, shall not come. Now, I don't know if you can uh, explain that verse to me without me going to the Amplified, but if you can, let me know. Okay, I'm going to read it in the Amplified. In the Amplified, it phrases it this way. Like the sparrow in her wandering, like the swallow in her flying, so the curse without cause does not come and alight on the undeserving. So the, I think the curse without cause is um, if you curse another person and they don't deserve it. Um, this cannot be talking about the curse caused from the fall of Adam and Eve. Uh, I think this is a curse when you, you curse a person and there's no reason for you to do it. Cursing might be also compared to be condemning or or shunning them and, and uh, condemning what they're doing. So when you do that without cause, uh, it does not come and alight on the undeserving. Uh, I don't know. It's 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 a difficult verse for me to explain. Do you have any thoughts on it? Yeah. Um, what was it uh, it's verse two there? Yeah. As the bird by wandering, the swallow by flying. So the curse causeless shall not come. You know, there's a lot of different ways to think about it. So one of the ways I know it's unorthodox in some of the things I say, but it's like you know, a curse has to have a cause. You know what I'm saying? And you can't, you know, a causeless curse, you know what I'm saying? It wouldn't make sense in, in the first place. So as Proverbs would say, you know, it's kind of like a way of thinking about in philosophy, you know, something has to cause the curse. Yeah, I actually, I think you've really simplified it. You zeroed in on the main point 
that uh, uh, there there should be a good cause before you curse, uh, or if if you're cursed, it should be with good cause. Um, and I, it doesn't mean curse necessarily, like you know, using profanity and cursing someone out, or it it, it and it doesn't mean like cursing them and saying condemning them to hell. I think it just means uh, like you're condemning them and you are judging them and condemning them and and saying that they're uh, uh, maybe unfit uh, to to even be in your company. I'm I'm reading a lot into it, but that's the only way it's, it's making sense to me. But I do think you made a good point that uh, a curse must have a, a cause for it to be uh, legitimate, I guess. Okay. Feel free to talk anytime you want, uh, at any time, if, interrupt me if you want. I'm going to go to I'm verse... I'm just listening, brother, just listening. Okay, I'm going to verse 3. It says, a whip for the horse, a bridle for the ass, and a rod <laughs> for the fool's back. <laughs> oh, boy. Well, you know, there's been many times as we've gone through, this is chapter 26, so... All these previous chapters, the idea of um, uh, some kind of punishment, uh, physical corporal type punishment, uh, spare the rod and spoil the child type of teaching. Uh, we've seen it many times in the book of Proverbs. And uh, so it, sometimes it is advisable and necessary. Uh, sometimes people are too quick to resort to that kind of punishment. But... Uh, a fool's back. Uh, I remember um, I had, my my father was pretty quick at uh, smacking me if I was out of line as a kid. I'm talking about, you know, let's say from like, you know, eight or 10 years old to, you know, 12 or 13 years old in that range there. I remember many times he'd just kick me in the butt or, uh, or one time, I was at a neighbor's house playing on his pool table and I guess uh, I didn't hear him calling for me to come to dinner and he had to go get me and he grabbed the pool cue out of my hand and broke it right over my back. <laughs> I think that was a little bit uh, extreme, but there were many times that I got belt, the belt and I got a switch by my mother or my father. And I, it was never like excessive beatings where I had to be in the hospital or anything. But I got the point, and I was disciplined, and I, I don't think it was unreasonable, really. Uh, but so it is appropriate, as it says here, it is appropriate for a fool to get his, uh, how does how is it phrased? Um, let me see. A rod for the fool's back. So a rod is just something you use to beat someone with in this case. And it says, just as it's appropriate for a horse to receive the whip and an ass to receive the bridle, um, a fool, it's appropriate for them to receive the rod on their back for something that's being, for being foolish. Um, do you have any children, uh, Neil? Oh, yeah, you hear my little one there, uh, Cohen and... Oh, yeah, I think you uh, even told me uh, the name of your child. What was it again? Uh, Max. Sorry, something was playing. I got to stop it. Hold on. Yeah. Darn it. I just had the uh, thing open, but some kind of ad started playing. But I had the commentary of Matthew Henry and a bunch of others. I was going yeah. to tell you about, but I had to close it because some ad started playing. But now you can hear my son cooing in the background now. Yeah, his name's like, Max. Is it is Max short for something, or is that his full name? Uh, we, we just shortened it to Max. It sounds, it's just short, simple. Um, I had read something about, you know, some saints. There was a Saint Maximilian. Um, I just love the name Max generally because uh, one of my uh, nephews, or yeah, he, he's named Max. They, they had one of my... Cousins had a kid named Max also, so but I just thought it's a, it's a nice little name that's real short and sweet. It's not biblical, of course. I mean, there's some things um, that are extra biblical about Maximilian, Max this, that, the other. Maximilian Kobe was a uh, prisoner uh, during World War II, I believe, or World War One, uh, and the um, I believe I believe it was World War II, and the Nazis had their little extermination camps or whatever. 
and, and the Holocaust, and they came by, and when they came back to the cell, he had converted everybody to Christianity in the cell. <laughs> and they all knew they were going to die. And uh, he was the last guy alive in the cell after two weeks, I think, of starvation. And they, uh, he held up his arm because he knew what was coming, is that they inject you with a carbolic acid to kill you off. And he, he held up his arm and said, you know, basically, he's like, do it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. Well, uh, how old is your boy, Max? Uh, he's almost a year now. Okay. And obviously, we don't use a rod in a one-year-old. Um, wow. and, uh, but there will come a point in time where you're trying to teach him things, and this nature that's in him that wants to rebel and do get, do his own thing and not listen to you. And, and for his own good, you have to teach him to do what you say. Uh, remember my son, uh, he's 30, he'll be 36 next month. And he said to me just a couple of years ago, so somehow the subject came up about p children that say, um, say why, asking why all the time. He says, oh, I, ne I never ask why. I said, well, what, do you, what do you mean you never ask why? He said, well, I, I asked you why one time when I was little, and, and you said, don't ever ask me why, just respond and do what I say immediately. And, and I don't have to give you a reason why, but, if, you know, but just do what I say, and then maybe I'll tell you why afterwards, but don't, I don't have to explain why before I expect you to, to obey. And so he said he... he he, I guess he learned his lesson, you know, when he was young and never asked me why again about that. But the point is, you can tell your child, stop, and they say, why? And then the bus ran over him. You didn't have time to tell them, to tell them because there's a bus coming. He's about to hit you, so stop, you know. Uh, but there's going to come a point when little Max decides to get defiant. Every child does it. And... Uh, uh, you're going to have to uh, deal with it and discipline him. Uh, You'll try to talk to him and reason with him and stuff, but then you're going to find out that uh, maybe necessary for you some kind of either a little spanking or a little uh, uh, some kind of discipline that makes him obey, uh, like uh, time out and restriction and stuff like that. Have you getting, given much thought to that? Oh, definitely. Yeah. I mean, see, I've I've actually gotten chastised. Uh, by a bunch of uh, non-believers on here that made videos about me saying that uh, back in the day I was talking about in the 80s when I grew up uh, that my mother and my step my father were ruthless I mean you know what I'm saying back then I mean if you acted a certain way I mean you get you get I mean not saying that physical abuse is okay but back then it was you know what I'm saying nobody really said anything against it back in the day and I think that's the difference between a lot of children today as opposed to the ones that grew up back then was that children were grew, uh, grown a little bit more stricter um, with parents that would exercise not physical abuse but restraint on their children. Um, when you see a kid knocking stuff over in a convenience store or something, you know, it's like now the kids are getting away with bloody murder nowadays without, you know, getting any kind of punishment like they used to. And it's, it's kind of saddening now that, you know, you got these kids growing up with, I guess that's why they, they kind of turn from their parents is that their parents never really had any kind of, uh, it's funny that you, we bring up this verse because my stepfather broke a, a plastic pool chair over my back when I was 14, when I was cursing at my sister and I told, I was calling her every name in the book and he heard me, he had come home from work and we didn't know he had snuck around the back to the pool. And we were we were sweeping the pool area as he had commanded, you know, and he found it and, and he didn't mean to hit me so hard, but he was ruthless on me. You know what I'm saying? Took a plastic pool chair and broke it over my back. I was like, <laughs> so I got disciplined pretty hard when I was a kid. I'm not saying that's OK to do to your kids nowadays, you know what I'm saying? But obviously I'm a different person because of that. I definitely would never go to that extent when it comes to my children uh, or child so far. Um, but you know, there's a certain, you know, like harassing women or, or doing, you know, there's certain things you don't do, you know what I'm saying? If, and if it takes physical force for me to stop my son from doing something, uh, drastic, you know, that, that would, uh, you know, be very bad in a way, like, uh, get him locked up or something, you know, <laughs> of course I'm going to exercise some restraint against him before the police do, you know what I'm saying?
I, I think it's important for everybody to understand, uh, you know, we, this is a Bible study. And we, we, in the Bible, we learn about our, the nature of man. Our, it, it comes naturally for man to be rebellious, to uh, want to get his own way and sin. Um, you don't, we don't have to be taught that. Uh, there's going to come a point where a max lies to you. And every, every person will learn how to lie on their own without being taught. And you'll have to teach them that, hey, they, it's not good, not right to lie. You got to, can't do that. Um, but children will test their parents all the time and see how much they can get away with. And, and if a parent is too lenient, then they'll just run all over them and they'll end up being some kind of grow up to be a person that has some kind of a psychological defect and doesn't know how to work within society so for their own good we need to discipline them and so there's a lot of verses in proverbs that teach us about disciplining our children okay i guess i'll go to let me read that in the amplified and see how it phrases it anyway it says a whip for the horse a bridle for the donkey and a rod for the backs of fools who refuse to learn all right verse four in the kjv says answer not a fool according to his folly lest thou also be like unto him. This chapter, I think, is going to be like a, a fool, the fool chapter. You know, there, it, all throughout all the books of Proverbs, you know, it's referencing the wise man versus the fool. And it sounds like this chapter so far is going to be concentrating a lot on the fool, the way the, a foolish person behaves. And uh, here, here's another one that's telling us that... Uh, don't get caught up in, if you know a fool, don't get caught up and be influenced by him. It says, answer not a fool according to his folly, lest thou also be like unto him. In the Amplified, it says, it says it this way, do not answer nor pretend to agree with the frivolous comments of a closed-minded fool according to his folly. Otherwise, you, even you, will be like him. I would also apply that to... Uh, my efforts in um, um, being ready with an answer for people on the Bible. But let me ask you to respond to the verse first. Go ahead if you have something to say. Yeah, I was going to go on to that point also, being ready with a verse, you know, being ready with something. If you don't have the answer, you know you don't have the answer. Sometimes some people ask stuff. I don't have the answer all the time. I can tell you what I think about it uh, off, of the, off of the bat, but I mean, I don't want to be too hasty and tell them that this is absolutely what it means. I'll just say, well, you know, thinking about it and I'll just, you know, and stuff like that until I uh, let me get back to you on that or something like that. But, uh, yeah, don't be too hasty. I don't, you know, don't be, uh, don't, you know, the fool will go to, her, to his own folly, basically. I mean, he's going to, he's going to try to foul you up with the stuff that fouls him up. See what I'm saying? In a way. Sorry, my son's talking back here. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. He, he's, uh, as I said before, I think he's speaking in tongues, isn't he? <laughs> All right. Sometimes he uh, does. I swear he speaks Japanese or something. Sometimes. <laughs> we don't even understand what he's saying. We're like, man, it's so weird because he, he can talk like a language. I don't know. <laughs> I think he understands what he's saying, but uh, you know, we don't get that language. But... Um, the idea of uh, answering when you don't really know the answer, that's a very big mistake. If, if, if someone's watching this video and, and you're uh, someone that is either doing evangelism, you're witnessing to people, telling them about Jesus and salvation, uh, or you're, you're interested in starting to do that, I, I would really caution you to... Uh, don't try to bluff your way through things. And when people ask you something, and if you don't know the answer, don't just be desperate thinking you've got to provide an answer all the time. Sometimes when the Bible says be be ready with an answer, well, sometimes the answer I have to give them is I, I don't I don't know. I'm sorry. I, I'm not sure how to answer that question. Um, and, and you're going to, not only is it the honest thing to tell them, but they're going to be, you have a lot more credibility when you admit that you don't know something instead of kind of trying to bluff your way through it and then they know that you're just being a fool. Yeah, <laughs> as, as this, a, don't yeah. try to beat him, beat him with his own weapons or beat him at his own weapons. 
you know, any, if, if they try to answer you with an ad hominem or anything like that, don't try to answer back with an ad hominem. That's, that's another way of thinking about it, too. Yeah. Another aspect of this verse here, though, that came to my mind was you know, amplified when it phrased it. Um, uh, do not answer nor pretend to agree with the frivolous comments of a closed-minded fool according to his folly. Uh, otherwise, you even you will be like him. Um, it, it says, uh, here it says, a closed-minded fool. Now, I don't know how the Amplified concluded that in the KJV when it says simply a fool, and then in the Amplified, they say it's a closed-minded fool, but I'm going to go with it. If you do encounter a closed-minded fool, and, and I, I'll tell you, I can encounter them almost on a daily basis in all my interactions on YouTube, and I have to apply the, the, the rule that Jesus gave us. And he, he says, do not cast your pearls to the swine. We should be intelligent enough, have enough discernment, to recognize that if someone is sincere in their question, and if they're just trying to, um, like, um, um, argue and try to win an argument, and if they're not even going to listen to your answer, if it's going in one ear and out, Jesus says if they don't have ears to hear. You know, uh, it goes in one ear and out the other. They're not even stopping to think and consider what you've told, you've already answered them, and they have another question. You have to learn, wait a second, my time is being wasted here. This, this is pearls to swine. I've always tested people because, see, I have about 550 videos I've made already. And, and, and so I've made videos and I have playlists on pretty much every theological subject in question. So if someone asks me a question that requires a much of an explanation rather than just one, you know, like a one or two sentences, I, I can I type a text and a brief answer. But if it requires much more thoughtful answer, I'll say, here's the, here's the video. That I spent uh, plenty of time answering it. Watch the video. Here's a playlist that goes completely very thorough answering your question. If you will watch them and then get back to me, then we can talk further about it. If you're not willing to watch it, it tells me that your your intentions are not good. You're you don't really uh, you're not really seeking an answer. Otherwise, you would watch the video because I'm saying the answer is in the video. So that's just a question of uh, recognizing that if uh, someone is closed-minded, we should learn not to waste our time on it. My our time is better spent um, uh, not wasting it on people like that, but finding people who do have ears to hear. And, and giving them the time. And I have encountered a lot of people on YouTube that I've had long dialogues with, and, and, and I, I'm willing and I I'm, I'm, enjoy spending the time with someone who, who's sincere and trying to give them the answers. And sometimes we win them over to Jesus uh, be, because their attitude is sincere. But once we recognize they're not sincere, you're better off putting your time and finding someone who really is sincere, really wants and has real sincere questions. Have you had any experiences like that? Well, I assume you probably stepped away. Uh, let me go on to the next verse. Yeah, verse sorry, I, I stepped away for a second. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, I just want to add real quick two seconds from your time. It was, uh, yeah, um, what you just said made perfect sense. I was I was trying to add it. My microphone wasn't clicking on for a second. Uh, was that, uh, do, 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 do. I'm trying to think of what I was about to say. Oh, uh, don't boast in yourself. Like, okay, so if you know you're evangelizing and you don't have the answer and and and, and you're not, you're not um, doing work for, I mean, if you're not working for God, you're starting to work for yourself. That's when I stop. You know what I'm saying? When I realize that all I'm doing is boasting about my own knowledge, then I stop. You know what I'm saying? I'm, uh, because then I'm not I'm not boasting about God. I'm boasting about myself. Then, you know, that's what I mean. Well, that's another. That's a separate point, and it, but it's valid. Uh, I remember um, when I first started street preaching. It was 
about 11 years ago. Uh, and our, let's see, December of 05, yeah. Um, uh, I wanted to do a, a very good job. So what I did was I, I took plenty of time and prepared myself. I actually wrote a sermon and the sermon was 90 minutes long and it was typed out. It was grammatically correct. It was written and rewritten and refined. It was beautiful and it covered so, so much of theology and I, I could, I memorized it 90 minute sermon word for word and I would go out and preach that. But it, it dawned on me that uh, m most of what I was saying there was um, superfluous to, to salvation. They didn't need all that information. And who was I really preaching for? Um, I was basically preaching for my own ego. Uh, I, I wanted to do, give Jesus my best, but on the other hand, I was really trying to impress the people and, and there were other street preachers too and impress them. And I, I made a great impression on them. They thought it was great, but I came to the conclusion that I really made a big mistake because uh, most of the people are not going to be there for the full 90 minutes of this sermon anyway. They're only going to hear part of it. And some of the people are just passing by and the passerby, uh, you only have maybe 60 seconds from the time they're approaching you, getting in front of you, and then leaving. You may have 60 seconds at most that they're hearing you. So I went from an extreme long message that had all kinds of theology that was <laughs> irrelevant, that they didn't need to know. Uh, but I was showing everybody how knowledgeable I was. Uh, and I, I went from that to the opposite extreme. And I developed sermons that are 30 seconds and 60 seconds long so that I could repeat it over and over again as people passed by. Because salvation, the message is really very simple. I've seen people put a video on YouTube, how to get saved, and the video is two hours long. And immediately I know that it's, it's going to be all wrong because it, if they're taking two hours to tell us how to get saved, then I'm sure it's not right. So, um, but I was asking you though, if you, if you've ever had to like, just, uh, cut off someone because you yeah, yeah. determined that it was, uh, pearls to the swine. Yeah. You know what? And that's what I wanted to say. It, it, there may be somebody walking down the street that only needs, needs to hear you for two seconds and they go home and think about it. They don't even need to talk to you. Maybe they just hear you street preach and then they walk by and they're just like, Hey, I'll go home and think about that. Maybe I'll go read the Bible I never have before. Maybe I should tonight. Maybe, maybe you know, <laughs> something that sometimes that happens. Even the wrong message can send somebody in the right way. You know what I'm saying? So I, I believe there's a purpose for everybody. God wouldn't let these uh, false preachers be out there if there wasn't a reason for it. So it's to show people who is the false preacher, you know. Or I'm not saying false preacher. I'm saying, like, you know, of course there's atheist up on the stand or just somebody, you know. I'm not talking about people's preaching the Bible, you know, you said you're preaching the wrong message, but I mean, even, even that somebody could have caught like a, a word or two of it and went home and thought about it. You know what I'm saying? Well, I, I didn't mean to say that I was preaching the wrong message, but what I was preaching was, um, uh, the, theologically it was all correct. It just was m much more than they needed to know. Uh, and, um, in other words, if you start teaching them about eschatology, for example, end times, how it's going to play out, and, and you start teaching them about uh, um, theological subjects and questions that are not related necessarily linked right to salvation, then uh, that's the purpose of a pastor. Matter of fact, I had a young, uh, young man that wanted to be a street preacher, and he worked with me for a while, uh, quite a while, and, and he wanted me to kind of help him learn how to do it. And he he was doing the same thing, making a mistake that I had made originally, and I was telling him about it. I said, you need to, you're telling them, if you, you have to decide, do you want to be an evangelist or do you want to be a pastor? Because an evangelist is someone uh, who is making a short message. See, angel 
is the root word of evangelist. So if you're an evangelist, you're an angel, not an angel in the respect that we're some other supernatural creature that's not human being, but, uh, uh, but an angel in respect that the word translates to messenger. We, uh, we are messengers from God with the message. Eve means good, where we, we've got a, the good message, the good news. We're one who's going to deliver the good news. That's evangelist. Yeah, so so if, that, if, if that's what we want to do, then, then if how much time and how much study, you don't have to even know the whole Bible. You don't have to know all the theological answers. You just need to know, um, tell them who Jesus is and how to get saved. Yeah. And, and, and you can do that very briefly. So this young man was, he was going on telling all things that were not relevant to salvation. I said, if that's what you want to do, maybe you better study and learn to be a pastor. A pastor's job is to teach people in the church and they go through the whole Bible and teach them all, every, all the theology. But an evangelist sticks strictly to the gospel and you, you have to repeat it over and over again to people. You were saying something? Oh, uh, the other word was minister. Sometimes I heard other churches use the word minister, minister of Christ. You know. uh, min every Christian is a minister. It's just that some people are not doing very much of it and are doing it very well, and some are working real hard in ministry. Ministry just means that it's, it's you, you've, you've accepted some kind of a job from God. You've got you've received a calling and 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 now you're going to work at your ministry or and you're going to serve so a minister is a servant um uh, that's why um G there's a translation where jesus says do not think that i came to be um uh, served but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for others for many uh, but that also translates to, I think, in the KJV says, do not think I came to be ministered to, but rather to minister and to give my life as a ransom. So the word minister just means to serve. And so you can serve in a lot of different capacities. You can serve as an evangelist, giving the good news. You can serve as a pastor, trying to help your, your congregation grow and mature in, in Christ. You can serve as an administrator, maybe doing paperwork in the church. You can serve as a uh, as an encourager and, and maybe a foot washer as far as uh, just trying to help other people. So that's how I would use the word uh, uh, minister is broader. But every Christian is supposed to be a minister. Uh, but not, our ministries are not necessarily all doing the same thing. So we're, we're a body with different parts, right? Oh, yeah. Yep. I hear you. That's what I mean. Yeah, that's what I was talking about. Okay, let me go on now here to the next verse. It says, um, verse, uh, verse 5, Answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own conceit. <laughs> okay, that's a... That's a famous verse. I've heard it repeated many times. And I'm reading it in the Amplified to see how it phrases it. It says, answer and correct the erroneous concepts of a fool according to his folly. Otherwise, he will be wise in his own eyes if he thinks you agree with him. Yeah. I guess we shouldn't just be nodding at the fools. Just nodding. And they might think we agree with them. Uh, if someone says something foolish, well, I don't know how really far we should apply this. Do you think it's appropriate to go around correcting every foolish thing that every person says? That goes along with, um, uh, see, there's an opposite verse to this that says, uh, secret love is, uh, sorry, open rebuke is better than secret love. So meaning to openly rebuke that person. And this doesn't mean go slander this person in public. It means to, you know, I forgot what verse it is. I, I'll have to look that one up. Open rebuke is better than secret love. Um, basically, like, don't go just praying for them if, if they're willing to talk to you about it. 
you know, they'll just nod your head if they're just if they keep just trying to talk to you about it. Um, try to stop them and correct them and say, okay, well, I've got to correct you here. Or I've got to, I've got to tell you that this is not this is the way I feel about it, or or this is what I believe that the Bible says instead of what you're saying, or or whatever you know. Sometimes, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think that's uh, good. Uh, but every time someone says something foolish in life, I think it's a mistake. For example, there was a, a book I read many years ago. I think it was by, there's two famous Carnegies, uh, Andrew Carnegie and another one. I can't remember, but I think it was Andrew Carnegie. But he was famous for great success and great wisdom and and, and uh, very being very um, um, very likable. Everybody liked him. And, and this there was a banquet, and this woman was able to talk to him. And she left afterwards praising him, saying he's the best. He's known for being a conversationalist. And she says it's true. He's the best conversationalist I've ever met. And and they said, well, what did you what did you talk about? And he said, well, he asked me a lot of questions about myself. <laughs> so the point was that, uh, you know, he, he let, he know, he realized what people really want to talk about is themselves. And if you ask them questions about themselves, they're going to be real happy because they get to talk about themselves. Um, but the, the, he also said, this is this is the point I was really wanted to get at is that let's say that you're in a in a, a room with a lot of people, and someone says something publicly, like uh, the 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 capital of the United States is New York City, and now you know that it's Washington D.C., but should you uh, cor correct them uh, publicly like that, and or they'll be embarrassed. Or you're better off just letting it go. So it's not always wise just to correct people over everything in life. However, here's the, here's where we have to <laughs> here's where we have to really uh, draw the line, though. We we don't want people misrepresenting the Bible. So when people say something that's uh, erroneous about the Bible, particularly if it's something really serious, there are all kinds of uh, viewpoints on different different uh, subjects that are probably uh, we can give liberty to each other for differing opinions but when it comes to the essentials of christianity we cannot compromise and if, if someone says something that's contrary to who jesus is if they're if they're redefining him or defining him incorrectly or if they're they're explaining people how to go to heaven and what's required and it's wrong then we do have an obligation to speak up and, and, and correct them, I would say. What, what do you think? My wife also says uh, Christmas instead of Christmas. Like Christianity, you say Christianity, you see what I'm saying? Yeah, it's pretty cool, you know, Christ, Christmas or whatever, Christ this, Christ. So I think a lot of people forget about that because, you know, the, the I think it's, uh, you know, because Christos is the way it's pronounced um, in Latin or whatever, and, and you know, in Spanish and whatever. But what I'm saying is, it's Christos that I don't. I speak English. We say Christ, so whether she'll say Christmas or Christ, whatever. But uh, the whole point I was going to say is, it's funny some of these verses in the next couple of verses that you, you're bringing up, right? Verses four through five, and then six through nine. Are we still on five or four? Uh, uh let me see what number it was. It was um. We're on four. Uh. We're on five, yeah. Five. Answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own conceits. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was on five. Yeah. Uh, uh, in the in the next couple of verses and these verses that echo it, because you know these verses have a lot to do with each other. Um, mm -hmm. They talk about Solomon, and, and you know Solomon's temple was one of the biggest, you know, most insane temples ever built. So, and it was so precise and it was so perfect and everything was, you know, huge and everything. This is what they're saying is, would you trust a fool to go do these things for you? Like, would you trust somebody that's foolish um, to run an errand for you? You know what I'm saying? Would they be entrusted with any business or errand? Would they be, uh, <laughs> like, are you going to send somebody who cannot fight through a battlefield to deliver a message? 
Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? That's what yeah. I'm doing. That kind of stuff too. Yeah, I, I think the main lesson from this verse, even though we can we can broaden its 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 applications, but basically it's saying if if someone is saying something foolish, don't let don't just let them think that you're in agreement. If you don't agree with it, you need to tell them. Otherwise, they will be wise in their own conceit. In other words, they'll 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 go they'll leave the conversation and think that they they they, they got it right when okay. when they were actually wrong and they need to be corrected. Yeah. But there is a place for uh, for uh, uh, considering uh, if you're going to embarrass them publicly. You know, we do have protocols about how to uh, how to uh, um, address pe these errors and with people we should go to the person directly and privately first before anything else if it's really serious um and, and they're in fellowship then you need to then go to the brethren and then uh, you know there is a, a prescription of how we're supposed to deal with it but i think we, you mentioned that yeah we need to talk to them one-on-one -on -one privately not publicly embarrassing that's what them. i mean like that's what i meant by the battlefield reference like let's say your friend comes up to you and says, hey, send me through a battlefield. I'm like, you are a fool. <laughs> you don't know how to fight. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Privately, I would tell him that. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Tell I your wife. Tell, I would tell everybody in public, I can't send this man to battle because he's a fool. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. Tell your wife that I was happy to hear when you told me that she uses the, she she uh, expresses it as Christmas. Uh, I, I've been doing that for years. Uh, when I see Christ in something, uh, I want to emphasize that it's Christ, like uh, Christianity, because uh, and Christian. Here she says, me, she says you're welcome. Here. Yeah. Welcome. <laughs> yeah. Because when we talk about Christianity, it seems like Christ is almost forgotten in it. And, and but if we say if we say Christianity. Christ is being emphasized. You can't. You cannot get around the fact that Christ is the, the center of that word, Christianity. Yeah, it's not Santa's holiday. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let me go on a little further here. Uh, uh, it says, uh, verse six: He that sendeth a message by the hand of a fool cutteth off the feet and drinketh damage. <laughs> Well, I think that's pretty self-explanatory. Wouldn't you say that uh, it's just foolish to depend? You would be foolish to depend that's, that's on fool. Funny. That's what I was talking about before when we were talking. Yeah, like, could I trust my friend who's a fool to go do something that I told him that he can't? You know, listen, you got it wrong, bro. <laughs> I love you, but you cannot do this task. You know. What I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah, we don't give responsibility to people who uh, are we're not confident that they have the ability to do it. Uh, okay, let me go to the next verse. Uh, verse 7, the legs of the lame are not equal. So is a parable in the mouth of fools. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, I like uh, how not only are we getting wisdom, but occasionally we find something that we can laugh at too. <laughs> I can in humility because I ha I am one of those lame legged people. <laughs> well, I think are you referring to literally that you're lame legged because of your motorcycle accident? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, but he might as well cut off his legs. It says in the commentary. <laughs> yeah, but in the in the in the idea of understanding parables, you know, you, you've got to be wise to understand parables. Uh, uh, Jesus said that the reason he spoke in parables was so that certain people could not understand. And people would think, well, that's cr crazy. Why would Jesus not want someone to understand his message? Uh, they had to have the right heart content. See, if their heart was right, if they're tr humble and they're really seeking, then they'll get it. But if they're religious and vain and self-righteous and, and, you know, the parable is going to flow right right over their head. They won't yeah, even I'm get I'm not going to send somebody like that to one of my friends who is obviously suffering. So I'm not going to send somebody who is a like a hardcore, I'm sorry to say, Calvinistic kind of whatever it is, you know what I'm saying, person, on somebody who's considering suicide. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I'm not going to send one of those extreme Christians towards somebody who is – uh, needing more of the gospel of grace than anything. You know what I mean? Yeah. 
Yeah. All right. Let me go to the next verse. Um, verse eight: As he that bindeth a stone in a sling, so is he that giveth honor to a fool. Huh. I'm not. Sure. I better look at that in the amplified. Like a precious stone. I mean, the the difference between a precious stone or a heap of common stones. I'm thinking the stone in a sling is like the slingshot that uh, that David used to slay Goliath. Uh, but let me see what the Amplified, how it phrases it. It says, like one who absurdly binds a stone in a sling, make it imp making it impossible to throw. Oh, I see. Binding it means you're putting it in the sling in a way that it won't come out when you, it, it's impossible to throw it. So is he who absurdly gives honor to a fool. So in other words, if you put a, a stone in your sling and it's bound up inside it and it can't get free to when you go to sling it, that would be pretty foolish and it, because you're making the sling and the stone useless. And it says, so is he who absurdly gives honor to a fool. That's just as inappropriate as giving honor to a fool. <laughs> Yeah, it, was, uh, it says to give honor to a fool is to put a sword in a madman's hand, to which we want not know what mischief he may do to even those who put it into his hand. Like he's going to bite the hand of the master, you know. Yeah. yeah. Is that Matt? Do you say that's Matthew Henry's uh, commentary yeah, you're looking at? Matthew Henry's, yeah. Okay, let me go to the next I think verse. That's pretty funny, though. Like, you know, because. I've done that though. Somebody gave me too much power and I bit the hand of who gave me the power. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Uh, yeah. We, we, I guess we, we need to be wise when we delegate uh, to other people and to make sure that we're not giving them something to do that they're not really qualified to do. Uh, okay, it says uh, in verse 9, as a thorn goeth up in the hand of a drunkard, so is a parable in the mouth of fools. A thorn goeth up in the hand of a drunkard. I guess he's getting stabbed with a thorn because he's drunk. Let me look at it in the Amplified. He says, like a thorn that goes without being felt. Oh, okay. If you're drunk, you're numb. You're not going to feel the thorn stick in you. Like a thorn that goes without being felt into the hand of a drunken man, so is a proverb in the mouth of a fool who remains unaffected by its wisdom. Now, I, I really like that saying. What do you think? Yeah, it's like uh, they're not fit to deliver these things. Um, it, like, again, throwing your pearls to swine. If you're going to tell somebody um, something that means something, I mean, to, to most Christians or or just something like that and just be like, hey, you know, this is what everybody else believes. And then they they take that and they twist it, you know what I'm saying, <laughs> to, to sound the way they want it to, yeah. Well, you know, it's mentioned Proverbs now a couple of times and being a fool and not being able to understand the proverb. But I have just a question for you. Uh, uh, there's... Uh, in, in the New Testament, we find Jesus speaking a lot of Proverbs. And as I said earlier, he said, he was asked why he speaks in Proverbs because, because pe people are all getting all confused. They, they don't know what he's talking about. And he, he says he's doing it on purpose so that, so that uh, only the people who have the right attitude will be able to get it. And, uh, uh, but as I've studied all the Proverbs over many, many years now, and I've looked at commentaries and different ways of uh, different people's opinions and what they mean. Uh, I'm not confident that that I can really say with confidence that I can accurately explain every single proverb. There's most of them I, I believe I can, but then there are some that I just don't feel I, I'm not that confident. How confident are you in understanding all the proverbs? None. Yeah, I mean. I mean I I can't, I can't sit here and say I know every single, like, I have the best interpretation of anybody on the planet. Yeah, right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I was using the word proverb, but I meant parable. Yeah, yeah, parable, yeah. I meant parable. I parable Jesus spoke yeah. parables. Uh, 
So you're saying that there are some that you feel that you're not confident in either? I mean, most of them, I feel like um, if somebody, if I've, I've heard, I've heard just about every, I've read the Bible as much as I could. You know, of course, I'm not going to be able to memorize every single word and, pro, and, you know, there's a lot of books. There's 66, 66 books. I don't know how many words exactly there are, but there's a lot, you know, depending on what version you're reading. And it, it's hard to memorize all this stuff to, co to commit it to memory. But if somebody brings something up, I do have some, some sort of a photographic memory to where I try to memorize something about that verse that speaks to my heart as a Christian. So it really comes out of, out of the Holy Spirit working in me uh, of what uh, comes out of my mouth. I'm not going to say something that comes off of the top of my mind if the Holy Spirit doesn't convict me or compel me to tell that person, you know, saying what, what it means, you know, in that way. Yeah. Well, uh, I was referencing just, just the understanding, not of the Bible as a whole and all scripture, but just, just the, the things that we refer to as parables, like the, the parables of the workers in the vineyard, the parable of the sower. I mean, to me, those are those are ones that are pretty easy. But then there are, are some that uh, there's a great disagreement over the meanings, and and even those two, there's a lot of different agreement on the agreement on uh, meaning of those. But um, uh, I feel pretty confident in almost all of them. But there are a few that I really uh, I just can't claim that I can't speak with authority and say, uh, let me teach you what that means. I'm I'm absolutely yeah, I sure. Correct. It comes to the point when somebody tries to convict you over something like this. You know, they're like, "Oh, well, you're the stupid one that Proverbs is talking about." You know, that's yeah. the problem. That's that's what that's what I would be like. Okay, bro, I love you. You know, what I'm saying, but I'll I'll go on. Mm -hmm. Let me see. Uh, let me go verse ten here. The great God that formed all things both rewardeth the fool and rewardeth transgressors. Um, to me, a fool and a transgressor, is, they're both uh, negative. So the kind of reward that someone who's do, doing something wrong, either being foolish or transgressing, it would not be a good reward. It would be more like, uh, uh, you know, a, uh, some kind of a, a, a punishment. Uh, now, obviously, if you're a child of God as, as we are because of our faith in Jesus, then then the correction that we get is is called chastisement. But uh, then uh, if you're not a child of God, then I think God does also intervene on the, the, lo the lost world and, and he will uh, reward people too when they're when they're wrong, uh, when they when they're doing something bad. But um, a lot of times, though, it just is the natural I used to call it the law of reaping and sowing, but I realized that from studying the book of Job that uh, uh, Jesus referred to it as reaping and sowing, and Paul called it reaping and sowing, but neither one of them actually used the terminology of the law of reaping and sowing. That's something that I kind of invented or, or heard somewhere, but it really is a principle that generally, if you're doing the right things, you're going to get good results out of your life. If you're doing the wrong things, you're going to suffer the consequences. That's reaping and sowing. But it's not always the case. Sometimes bad things happen to good people and vice versa. So uh, uh, it, it's not a law, but it is a, uh, uh, a principle. And in this case here, I think it's talking about, it says, the great God that formed all things both rewardeth the fool and rewardeth the transgressors. And it, it's not saying and rewardeth the wise man. Uh, both of these, the fool and the transgressor is a negative thing. Let me read it in the Amplified and ask you to respond. Like a careless archer who shoots arrows wildly and wounds everyone, uh, so is he who hires a fool or those who chance by, who who by chance just pass by. Wow, that was really interesting. I'm going to read that again. Like a careless archer who shoots arrows wildly and wounds everyone, so is he who hires a fool, or those who chance just by 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 chance just pass by. Huh. I never would have got that out of that verse. 
Well, there's, I think there's two different ways to look at it, you know. Um, the way Matthew Henry and a bunch of other commentators are saying it. Um, God doesn't hire fools. In a way. Or else his kingdom would fall. Uh, that's just my own commentary, you know what I'm saying? That God, does, God wouldn't hire somebody that... Um, that uh, that would um, be vexatious to him, or be uh, be bad to him, you know, or in a way, um, God hires the people that would do good to him and be good servants of, and to him. Um, the same way that you would talk about a man or a king, like a king uh, would hire good people to work under him, or else his kingdom would fall. Um, so. I heard a, a rapper, a Christian rapper, once say, we should pray for Barack Obama, even though if you don't like him, you know what I'm saying, because he is the king of our country, and we hope that he makes the best decisions possible, all the authority under him, uh, our lives might be qu quiet and peaceful. You know, it, it, it's, it's hard, you know, just, we, I hate to say, pray for them, you know what I'm saying, not pray under them, you know, don't pray... <laughs> Don't pray because they're they're not God, but you know what I'm saying. God mm -hmm. doesn't hire because we want to we want to pray for the people that that God hires in a way, you know. Yeah. Well, um, normally I reserve a few minutes to do a um, a gospel invitation. Uh, I'm going to try to make it real brief here, but let me ask you a couple of questions about the gospel. Now, well, I'm, I'll do it that way. It'll be a little bit different here, but. Um, I, I have an opinion about the, the biggest mistake in the world and, and as far as the, the, the fact that almost everybody in the world today and everybody who's ever lived, they're making a big mistake uh, in believing that, uh, that there's a, another way of getting to heaven besides Jesus. What, what do you think that, that they're putting their faith in, that other way? That sounds like Oprah. Oprah had said that once on her show. Uh, that there's another way to he heaven or God besides Jesus. And I was like, no, there's not. There's only one way to God. And Jesus himself said that I am the way. How, yeah. how do you refute that? Yeah. Well, uh, the way uh, the people are trying to get to heaven, uh, almost all people in the world today, if you ask them, what do you have to do so you can go to heaven? Uh, they're going to they're going to base it upon some kind of a personal uh, effort on their part. Uh, they got to be a good person. Maybe they got to be religious, and, and and then and then when they die, God will judge them. And say, well, you were good enough. You get in. So it's based upon uh, personal merit. That's the that's the error that people they're putting their faith in that being the way. They're putting their faith in themselves. And now another mistake people make is, is putting your, their faith in another person besides Jesus, like a Pope or like the Virgin Mary, or putting their faith in themselves, their own self-righteousness. So when Jesus says he's the way, that means that Muhammad's not the way, Buddha's not the way, the Pope's not the way, Mary's not the way, and you're not your own way. Jesus is the way to get to heaven, the only way. And he says he's the truth. Uh, you can study philosophy. You can study all the religions of the world. But the Jesus is the one truth that you must believe. You must believe in him <laughs> as a person and a savior. And then he's the life, he said. And that means that uh, if you want life everlasting in heaven, he's the source of life. And you, need, and you receive it only through him. So my, my question basically is this. If if you were going to single out the big mistake that the world is making, almost everybody in the world is doing that, making that mistake. They're putting their faith in their own ability or a religion or another person like Muhammad or Buddha or something, rather than them putting their faith in this person and the work of Jesus. Um let me ask you next about this person of Jesus, okay? It's, it's also very important to 
understand who he is exactly. Now, there are, there are Muslims say they believe in Jesus. They say he's a great prophet and they really respect him and revere him as a prophet. Um, uh, Jehovah Witnesses, uh, they say they believe in Jesus too. They believe that he is the first thing that God created. He is a creature. And then through Jesus, everything else was created. And then there's other philosophers and they say, Jesus was a great moral teacher. But my question to you is what, what uh, Jesus asked the apostles. He says, who do you say that I am? Brother Neo, who do you say Jesus is? God. Uh, well, Catholics can say God a God. But I do believe Jesus was God's son and also God on earth. It was God using his son to talk to people. The, the, the distinction that is unique to Christianity is that Jesus is not merely a great moral teacher. He's not merely a prophet and he's not the, the first uh, object of God's creation. And then through he, him, all things were created. No, Jesus is God himself. Jesus is eternal God almighty manifest in the flesh as the son of God, Jesus Christ. So we really see the Bible says that only God is the Savior. And the scripture says Jesus is the Savior. If Jesus is, if we're going to put our faith in Jesus as our Savior, there's no way around uh, the, the fact that we must also acknowledge him as God, because only God can save. His, lay, his name actually literally translates to God saves. Jesus is this God who saves. Now, how, trying to explain how there's one God and there's the Father God, the Son God, the Holy Spirit God, that's a philosophical thing that they debated for centuries. And, and uh, I believe it's all true, but, but trying to explain that in, in a way that makes sense to everybody that we could spend hours doing it. I've done it. I, I've spent many, many hours on other playlists uh, examining that question. But the key is Jesus is not a creature. He's eternal God almighty who became a man who died for our sins. So now the sin barrier between man and God is removed because he paid for our sins. Now, here's the most important part. We know that he died on the cross, paid for our sins, he was buried, but on the third day he was raised from the dead. Why do you think this resurrection is so uh, integral and significant? And, and I'll add to that. That's what I was gonna say was that, um... That was, that was the purpose of, of God showing that you can be resurrected. He would give his own son to show you that you can be resurrected too. That was the whole point of Jesus was telling you that you can be with me. That's what he told the thief on the cross. You can be with me in paradise. You, you See, the, the best superpower on the planet, kids, if you ever listen to kids, if there's any kids listening, is to resurrect you don't need any bullets or bombs or guns or anything or torture techniques or anything if you can resurrect and, and have a new life that is the best superpower you can ever have and jesus had that power the power to become new again the power to be resurrected that you have eternal life nobody can ever uh take your life again that's that's the whole that's the best thing ever yeah, well said. The uh, uh, And the Bible says not only God can be our Savior, but it also says only God can give life. So Jesus is the life. He is the life giver. And so the, the resurrection, uh, he said in the, early in the book of John, I'm, you know, we're doing this study in the book of John. I'm on chapter six now, but right in chapter one, right after he was uh, met John the Baptist and got Andrew and, and, and Peter and people were asked him for a sign. And he says, destroy this temple. And in three days, I will raise it up. And they said, well, how can you do that? It took 40 years to build the temple. 
And you're saying you you can build rebuild it in three days, you know? <laughs> and then it says that he was speaking about his body, and and then a, a later on he's asked that probably years later he's asked this question again about about demanding a sign this was after he's done you know maybe 50 different miracles that everybody knows about they say well prove who you are with a, with a sign and he, he says the only sign i'll give you is the sign of jonah just as jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days and three nights so shall the son of man be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights and it says this is him speaking again about his death burial and resurrection so he promised that he would give us a sign to prove his claims were true that he's god and savior and and he raised himself from the dead and uh it's it's uh well witnessed he he walked among 500 witnesses for 40 days they saw him and talked to him and touched him and ate with him uh, and this bodily resurrection is a great fact and that that resurrection is the sign that gives me it gives us all confidence that our faith in Jesus is justified oh yeah um, the amen uh, I was gonna tell you um, I love everything man that, that you do here and I want you to continue that I'm going to be missing in action for uh, a little while. I've got a lot of college stuff to do. I'm finishing up and uh, graduating. Um, I'll be back around in a couple of months probably, but uh, I'll be here off and on. You know, you'll see me around. But uh, God bless you and your family and everything, brother. All right, brother, thank you. Uh, anytime you're able to participate, it's always a, a a pl pleasure for me to have your your, your fellowship so uh i'll pray for you and your your education and uh, i'm sure you'll do very well with that and and uh as as you said uh if if you'll be gone for a while if just pop in whenever your schedule permits look forward to next time okay no problem man i uh i love you man <laughs> all right all right uh, to all the viewers bless you all in the name of our great savior god jesus christ